Good evening, friends, and welcome back to the second season of our Community Conversations, um, which are hosted by the Unitarian Universalist Urban Ministry. I'm Reverend Mary Margaret Earle, and I'm the Executive Director of the Unitarian Universalist Urban Ministry. Our mission is to work across race and place to dismantle racism and white supremacy culture and to advance racial, social, and economic justice. In 2022, we operate a shelter for survivors of domestic violence, a workforce development program for trauma survivors, and an after school and summer employment program for high school students. We also engage and serve our Roxbury community through the arts and humanities and lectures and gatherings like tonight's. And we're so glad to have you here with us again. And I'm so happy to also introduce my wonderful colleague, Monique marshall Veal, the Director of Special Projects for the Urban Ministry. Thank you, Mary Margaret, and Happy New Year, everyone. Happy Thank New you for Year. joining us again um, for our community conversations. Um, over the past year and a half, um, our community conversations have highlighted the history, art, and experience of Black and Indigenous people of color. These conversations provide an opportunity to raise awareness around some of the issues that plague the residents of color in Boston neighborhoods. These conversations have also provided information on how to support organizations in the work that they are doing to help people of color. It is our hope that these conversations continue during the next year and vir mostly virtually, but someday soon in person. Um, so please stay connected to us about upcoming conversations. And lastly, thank you as always for joining us for this evening's conversation. And we look forward to hearing from our guests this evening. Thank you, Monique. You're welcome. The Urban Ministry is a nonprofit organization and we are in John Elliott Square in Roxbury and we're encircled by about 50 Unitarian Universalist congregations that are our members and they engage in our work for justice. Two of those congregations are tonight's sponsors of our community conversation. They are First Parish in Kingston and First Church Boston. And we so appreciate those congregations stepping forward to support these um, discussions. And tonight we wanna share a message called a commitment minute from one of those congregations, First Parish in Kingston. So here's First Parish's commitment minute. Good evening to all of you. It is an honor for First Parish Kingston to sponsor this evening's community conversation. My name is Jackie Hoxton and I'm the delegate from our parish to the urban ministry. First Parish Kingston has had a long partnership with the Unitarian Universalist Urban Ministry, our work focusing mostly on the Renewal House. Sponsoring this event is important to us as a community, as it provides an opportunity for us to appreciate Black artistry and creativity in the work of Ashley Gordon in the Performing Arts Group, Castles of Our Skins. This event will bring awareness to our community and others around the ways creativity bridges gaps and connects us to our shared humanity, as well as opening doors to explore black history and culture. We look ahead to our continued partnership with the Unitarian Universalist Urban Ministry. Thank you for your participation in this event this evening. And again, it is an honor to be here in support of the work of the Urban Ministry. Enjoy. Thank you. So over the past year and a half, it seems so long ago, um, we started to promote small business owners of color by creating community commercials. These commercials showcase incredible food, great products and services. These commercials allowed business owners to market their business during a very challenging time in our country. So as you think about places to eat and shop someday soon, we will be able to do all of this again um, and we will enjoy each other's company. Please think about some of the businesses that we have highlighted in our community commercials. And tonight's commercial is from Final Touch. Please enjoy, thank you.
Good afternoon, I'm Katherine Hardaway here at Final Touch Boutique in Dudley Square. Uh, this is a family owned business. I am one of the owners. Uh, the other owners are Dan Abu Bashir, my, my husband, and Haris Hardaway, our son. We also have store manager, Merlene Burrows, and we make up the team of Final Touch with Class. Hi! Usually you come in, you'll see my husband, Abu Bashir. Back in uh, 2005, my wife just says, I got an idea. Hey, what about a boutique accessory store? And I say, hey, why not? You'll see Haris, our son, who is really the one who does all of the very fashionable windows that people come by and admire. I'm Haris, and uh, this is what happens when you shop in Nubian Square. You get beautiful clothes. Um, we have our wonderful customer. Her name is Jackie and she's also a model for our store. Our customers are our models. You have an entire ensemble from Final Touch Boutique. She's wearing a beautiful off-white shawl uh, with the faux fur that's lined around and trimmed, the gloves. And as she opens up her shawl, you'll see this beautiful sequined cheetah print, and it comes with the vegan leather pants. It's a beautiful, beautiful dress. Now, if you'll follow me this way, I can show you more. I love this. This color is called Fawn. This is a, another vegan leather off the shoulder. We do all styles, Western, American styles as well. We have an entire section dedicated to our uh, African print. A beautiful pattern in the print. And so what you can do is match this with this. It's a very casual piece. If you throw a necklace or some earrings with this, you could wear this to work. We're located at 17 Warren Street in Nubian Square, Boston. Our hours of operation are Monday to Wednesday, 10 a.m. to 6 p.m., and Thursday to Saturday, 10 a.m. to 7 p.m. www.finaltouchwithclass.com and also Final Touch Boutique on Instagram. It's all here in Nubian Square, so please come join us. Some really beautiful things there. Hi. So um, as we get ready to introduce our two very wonderful and special guests, I did want to remind everyone that there will come a portion of the show um, that you're able to answer, uh, to ask some questions by chat or in the Q&A box at the bottom. So you can kind of be percolating on questions that you might have for our two special guests, Ashley Gordon and Bithia Israel. So uh, I want to introduce uh, our friend Ashley Gordon, who at one point did serve on our meeting house committee at the Urban Ministry, helping us envision how our uh, meeting house could serve the community and highlight the artistry of the community. Described as a charismatic and captivating performer, Ashley Gordon has recorded with Switzerland's Ensemble Proton and Germany's Ensemble Modern performed with Grammy award-winning BMOP and Grammy-nominated A Far Cry String Ensemble, and appeared at the prestigious BBC Proms Festival with Shin Eke Orchestra. Comfortable on an international stage, Ashley has performed in a number of venues and concerts in London, Germany, Switzerland, Paris, and Hong Kong, and throughout Sofia, Bulgaria, as part of the multidisciplinary 180 Degrees Festival. Ashley is co-founder, artistic executive director, and violist of Castle of Our Skins, a Boston-based concert and educational series devoted to celebrating Black artistry through music. In recognition of her work, she has presented at Ideas UMass Boston Conference and the 180 Degrees Festival in Bulgaria. She has been featured in the International Musician and Improper Bostonian Magazines, as well as Boston Globe. And she was awarded the 2016 Charles Walton Diversity Advocate Award from the American Federation of Musicians. She's a 2015 St. Botoff, Botoff Emerging Artist Award recipient and 2019 Brother Thomas Fellow, a nominee for the 2020 Americans for the Arts Johnson Fellowship for Artists Transforming Communities, and named one of WBUR's Artery 25, 25 Millennials of Color Impacting Boston's Arts and Community Scene. 
I am honored to introduce Bithia Israel, my colleague and friend. Bithia is a Boston native and is the founder and community organizer and cellist, composer, and multimedia artist who centers, whose work centers on social justice and equal access for communities of color. She is a woman of Dominican and European descent and a child of the inner city. Bithia's lived experience has rendered a dedication to and a belief in the power of community spirit. She is the founder of City Strings United, a creative youth development organization providing free access to exciting music, education, and performance opportunities to youth in Roxbury, where she shepherds events featuring artists, arts through a local, through a social justice lens. Bithia is a recipient of the Woman of Courage and Conviction Award from the Greater Boston section of the National Council of Negro Women for her work through City Strings United and is a current board member of the Arts and Business Council of Greater Boston. She is also a member of the Massachusetts Production Coalition and Celebrity Series Community Engagement Community Committee. Her music compositions have featured have been featured in Columbia University and NYU film projects and theatrical productions in Massachusetts and Washington State. And as I stated before, she is a colleague of mine and she is the social justice fellow for the arts and humanities at the Urban Ministry in Roxbury as well. Welcome, Bithia. Welcome, Ashley. Welcome both. Yes. <clears throat> Hi. Hello. Okay. We're so honored. I mean, there was so much to say and we gave just actually um, a, just a portion of your introduction and bios. We could have said more, but obviously um, there's so much you both have accomplished and we're really proud uh, and grateful and honored that you're spending this evening with us. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm going to actually um, start with um, uh, with Bithya, if I may. Um, and I do want to also give a little shout out to Bithya. If you loved the commercial, Bithya also has become a master of the video production um, world since the onset of pandemic and has created many of the beautiful um, artist galleries that we have at the Urban Ministry, the Black owned commercials. Um, so created a whole platform for us. Um, so thanks for that wonderful final touch video, Vivia. Um, and I wanted to just, Vivia, you, you know, you didn't, um, you didn't hesitate to agree to be on this this evening, this um, topic of artists as activists. And I wonder if you could kind of break down what did that mean to you and what, what spoke to you about that, the topic, artists as activists. Thank you. Well, thank you for uh, the event. I was very excited because um, through my artistic work, I've found myself in the role of activist. So it was really inspiring to see the Urban Ministry um, really want to focus on what this is all about. So, um, you know, artists, our practice, our training uh, trains us to be able to, to communicate with people who we've never been able to meet. So in that training, uh, in that preparation, we have a sort of ability to um, communicate about what we imagine. Artists, I think, Ash, you probably would agree with me, artists are really uh, attuned to kind of an inner vision. Uh, we're able to easily reimagine things and reimagine our world. And through our mediums, we're able to um, bring those imaginings to life. Now, activism where, um, you know, we do something to campaign for social or political change, uh, when you combine the ability to communicate to someone who perhaps has a different specialty, not a specialty um, in imagining things, <laughs> which uh, artists seem to do um, a lot of, um, the ability to, to translate that thought or that image, that uh, dream 
into a language that can be felt and received by the by the masses. Uh, and then when you combine that with a cause, uh, a concern um, that needs addressing, that's a very powerful mix. So I really loved the title for tonight's event. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if, if I could elaborate too. So I'm, I'm just over here, <laughs> not listening to music, but just resonating <laughs> with, with what you're saying, Vithya. Um, I, for, for me, artist is uh, very much a, a um, visioner, as you said, creator, uh, literally putting into existence, speaking into existence, putting out energy into the world that is maybe not already physically there, ideas, thoughts, etc. Um, being able to create out of virtually what seems to be uh, nothing. But um, some quotes from educator and philosopher Maxine Green, Dr. Maxine Green, come to my mind, and I, I share this often with students about the role of artists and to pair that with active as an act, a verb, as uh, re related to activism, I think for me it makes a lot of sense. Um, for artists, and I'm just going to quote directly from Dr. Maxine Green, they open our eyes. They stir our flesh. They may even move us to try to repair. So there is a very real charge of being a catalyst, being a change agent, using yourself and your creativity and the energy, um, the space, the the artistic practice that is being birthed into existence, being able to use that as a way of causing some kind of reaction. Um, I, I think it's it's really powerful you as, as a cellist, I as a violist, we could we can make sounds that cause an elevation of your heart rate, literally transport you to a different uh, time zone, a, a different climate without without any other kind of manipulation. That's, that's a pretty powerful cause and effect. And then to your point to add on a, a mission behind that, we could really do do wonders. And then my all time favorite quote, if I, if I were a tattoo bearing person, this would be the tattoo that I would wear. Um, that artists try to open persons to the new and the multiple. We want ourselves to break through some of the crests of convention, which is such a powerful image. I, I think of so many conventional um, uh, prohibitive thinking, ideologies, practices that we have, institutions, and just all of those bursting. Uh, the distortions of fetishisms, we want to, uh, have the sour tastes of narrow faiths be broken. Um, so a real charge to to the role of an artist. Uh, so if if that is the thinking to adopt, it's synonymous with action. It's synonymous with change, cause and effect, being a catalyst, and and falls into um, uh, this this work of activism. I also um, would encourage audience audience members. Um, I, I tell this to people um, to pay attention to ourselves, right? So if we see something that we really love, right, you might see a, a movie that, that, you know, a tearjerker or something that you just can't get enough of, I would really encourage that kind of excavation of self. What was it that I really loved and that I wish that I could see more of? I believe that a lot of things are resonating with us as human beings all the time. Um, you know, you might see, you know, a child hug, hug someone or hug their parent and you just say, oh my gosh, that's so precious, right? Um, I would encourage us more and more to um, grab hold of what we experienced, what resonated with us, and, and, and to maybe bring it to the forefront in our lives uh, more. So, um, you know, in this world that we live in, a lot of times seeing is believing. And I believe that we, we come across a lot of things that we do see, but perhaps we let other things get in the way of or distract us. Um, I don't know, Ash, how you feel about this, but sometimes I get the sense in uh, our common culture that artists can be kind of crazy can be uh, assumed to be kind of some of those you know people who they're just kind of mysterious almost like the quintessential mad scientist you know you don't really know what they're up to and they might come up with something great but you know they just they're just different than the rest of us you know some people might feel that way um but i believe 
that we just tend to lead with those things that maybe um, <laughs> I have to speak in generalizations just to prove, you know, to bring up points. But of course, or of course I'm speaking in general. Um, other other people who maybe don't so much lead with these kind of visionary um, topics might have other things um, that that hold more weight in their everyday. So I would I'd be interested in Ash what you have to say about this. Um, as, as an artist, I feel that we sometimes lead with some of those things that um, maybe are not so much seen but more so felt as in we are performing artists even our instruments there's science behind it if you pluck us pluck an a string on one instrument the others a the other a strings in the room actually vibrate um so what, what do you what do you think about that that notion that we're leading by the heart and by the unseen yeah i i I think we have a very uh, unique perspective, the, the sort of mad scientist, as, as you say, how we may be perceived, but um, there's there's another quote that comes to my mind from uh, also an artist, a, a coach, um, kind of a career coach for artists, Andrew Simone has a very quick, easy read. I put in air quotes because it's, it's I think, pretty profound. I, I at least found it profound, making your life as an artist, it's called, uh, and he says, uh, on one page font, you know, 150 fills the whole page that the role artist plays in culture is essential. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's not so much the art, the, the music, but the role, the active part is essential and other things that are essential to culture or, or for, for our existence are, you know, food, water, shelter, love. Uh, so our position as unique as it is, as perhaps um, mystical as, as it may be, or non-tangible as it may be, it's it's a hugely necessary and vital uh, aspect of, of our existence. Um, and the idea of being creative, of playing, we all have that capability. We're all literally born into this world as um, not knowing really much much beyond that. I'm, I'm no pediatrician to, to quote me on that, but the idea of play and creativity is um, a, a natural phenomenon for, for us. And um, some of us have maybe retained that and refined that in other ways, but it's not a uh, baffling mystery since we all have that as, as a commonality. Um, yes. And yes, to your point, we can sort of highlight and emphasize in, in a creative way some things that are hiding in plain sight. And sometimes we need that in order for, for there to be progress. We need a sort of provocateur. Um, I'm thinking of Don't Look Up, if anyone saw this movie, um, which, which is a movie. But there's so much about it that is presented in a way to be provocative and also artistic. Um, and thinking certainly Nina Simone, other, other artists and creatives who use their medium as a way to find resonance, find connectivity, but also to be, uh, to know and recognize that I have your ear at this particular moment to highlight something that again, may be hiding in plain sight. Yes. And, you know, when I started City Strings in 2012, it, it started as, you know, offering cello lessons in Roxbury. So I thought that's what I was going to do. But what happened, what ended up happening was that the children responded um, and some of them have stayed for 10 years um, voluntarily on a Saturday morning um, asking to to learn more. Um, and to your point about ourselves in childhood, we know how to play. There are a lot of, um, you know, um, abilities that we have that if we are just left alone, sometimes they will grow and um, be practiced on their own. Um, you know, conventional um, education in this country, in, in a lot of instances, um, kind of revolves around the necessity for controlled behavior and obedience, um, which sometimes stifles creativity, does not allow children to remain children, happy and playful, and at the same time, acquire the skills that we're trying to teach them. 
um, city strings, we believe that you don't have to choose. You can be a child and be happy and active and um, have fun and learn and be celebrated as a leader um, from an early age because you already enter with these innate qualities. You already are leading um, by the mere fact that you came and you're participating, you're adding an important element to the whole. So, um, you know, the activism started uh, really kicking in when I realized that sometimes children are are missing out on these things. These are very basic, basic, basic um, um, elements that should be um, really, I believe, you know, foundational in our in our approach to education. I don't believe you should have to um, conform in order to learn something. You should be appreciated for your individualism and um, be given the opportunity to contribute your ideas, right? So um, again, I guess the reimagining our world and our systems can, uh, can be put into play even in a small um, organization. Thank you, Bethia. Thank you, Ash. Um, and, and keeping with that voice of being able to have a say so in who you are, um, we can see on this screen that there are two beautiful women here of color. And I know that there's so much more to what we see right here, and you've developed that. And as I think about your journey um, and your identity, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about what that journey to developing your identity has been like for you. You know, um, oftentimes we are faced with the question, well, how do you identify? Are you a cellist? Are you an artist, activist, violist? Who are you? And I don't, I, I don't know if you can identify yourself as one or all of them. And if there's a particular order for you. So if both of you could speak to that, that would be helpful. I could maybe start first. Okay. Um, Thank you, Ash. <laughs> to to um, your earlier question about sort of how uh, identity formation was realized, mm -hmm. I have a different answer to to the sort of last question, which which one do you identify with? Um, and I did not necessarily come into consciousness of myself and the power of myself, the potential that I that I had until quite late for me, uh, graduate school, really. Um, and that, that was for me a, a sort of reflective understanding of why I didn't feel comfortable, why, why I felt awkward or as though I was posing, I didn't feel particularly authentic and didn't have quite honestly the vocabulary, um, to understand how to even begin that journey, but, um, realized several things that I was not. And uh, that clarity really helped drive for me, okay, well, what, what fills that gap? If I'm not this, then what fills that, that hole? Um, and for me, very much realized that I'm not an orchestral musician uh, and very much to, to sort of Bithia's point where we are born a certain way and then it's regimented and you're sort of on this track. And for, for me, having gone to conservatory, um, two master's degrees in in uh, classical and contemporary music, there's there's sort of a prescribed end goal, uh, which never resonated for me. Um, so very much understanding and uh, uplifting the idea of intimate experiences, chamber music, having a uh, say, which is not necessarily the same in being in a large orchestra of 80 people. Um, I realized that I am a nerd and I love that and I enjoy history and research and um, ex exploring, finding through lines and wanted more time to invest in that. I realized that I'm an educator, but not a public school educator, uh, that I very much uh, appreciated and wanted to be in spaces that allowed to have one-to-one -one, uh, mentorship uh, opportunities. And in my work as an educator for the past 20 years have grown those experiences for myself uh, and, and for those that I can engage with. Um, very much realized that I enjoy the the process 
of ideation to realization of sort of dreaming up something and then all all the administrative back end so i love color coding my spreadsheets and and puzzle piecing things together to be able to see it come to life um, and find find pleasure in that that does bring me happiness so um for me very much an understand and also a violist i didn't even re reference that uh, i started on piano uh, which was just a horrible experience, and then switched to violin, uh, which from the age of three, I knew I wanted to be a violinist. And then I say came to the age of reason in college and switched to viola. Um, but for me, the the characteristics and the application of a violist is one to be central, which is how I see myself, to be a facilitator, very much a connector. We connect the cellists to the violins uh, in, in the string section. We may not necessarily be front and center all the time, but you'll definitely know if we're not there. We add we add a thickness, a richness, we add substance, context, um, uh, which, which is the work that I have engaged with and, and enjoy to be able to do. Um, I don't necessarily need the the accolades and the solo spotlight like a like a violinist um for instance not to if any violinists are <laughs> listening but i i enjoy the um being in the weeds to be able to hear and potentially manipulate things around me um in in a i wouldn't say devious way but in in a subtle way in a nuanced way um and that very much fits my role as, as a leader to be a facilitator, to help uh, enable other people around me to, to also uh, work together, to be very much in community is very deep and near to my heart, um, as is again, the role of, of a violist. There are certainly soloists who are violists, but oftentimes we, we work well in, uh, in groups. Um, so those, that sort of reflective thinking of, of ways I was being pushed in, into certain identities, uh, how that felt antithetical to what it is that I actually um, felt resonated and what actually brought me joy. So when I recognized that and I was able to live into those characteristics, those qualities, um, I, I felt far more liberated and able to also very opinionated and, and enjoy my autonomy. I didn't reference that. Uh, and so being an entrepreneur, being a creative, taking taking an idea again and putting it into fruition uh, is very exciting. And that's really what Castle of Our Skins has, has been about for the past 10 years. Um, all that to say, I think now I, I reference um, Citizen Artist as, as what is maybe the most encapsulating for me and uh, the ordering I think is really important. So citizen first, I am a um, occupant of this earth such as anyone else on this Zoom and anything else that has no capabilities to be on a Zoom. I'm an, I'm an occupant here, uh, a steward and need to work in fellowship with all that is around me um, as, as a citizen, as a uh, a recipient of of what is around me, right? And because of that, I have an onus to um, make sure that my community is well. I have an onus to make sure that the next generation is cared for, an onus for um, making sure that voices are represented, etc. I, I see that as being a citizen uh, first kind of duty, and that my medium, in terms of citizen artistry, my medium is music, is arts, uh, to be more more broad. Um, and I, I do think that it is an artistic practice to create, to create a concert program, to create a 60 minute, 90 minute experience that is transformational, to be able to create educational workshops and programming um, and, and spaces that allow for a conversation, for facilitated conversations such as this, an artistic practice, right? Um, in addition to getting up on stage and, and being a violist, uh, which often uh, is, is something very visible and easily recognizable that I that I do, but it's not the sole uh, extent of what I would consider my medium of arts. Um, and and facilitating conversations, doing doing much more listening as as uh, well, unlike right now talking, to to try to reflect back and create space, create opportunity um, for for things that I 
see as being uh, crucial, things that I hear in amplifying in ways in an artistic means. So very much citizen artist, I think, is encapsulating on kind of all of that mm -hmm. for me. Thank you. Well, I totally now was, you know, nodding also, Ashley, because, um, you know, you were taking some of the words out of my mouth. Uh, mm -hmm. So I came into being in this role um, through reading, kind of realizing a little bit like Ash was saying, um, you know, also feeling uncomfortable. Uh, I had a background where I did without a few things um, that perhaps would have um, brought more surety to my existence, you know, financial support, um, uh, uh, you know, maybe uh, generational wealth, family wealth, you know, didn't have that. And even though no one sits you down as a child and explains these things to you, you do pick up on these indicators of possible future success and reasons as to whether you should or shouldn't assume that you're going to win something. Um, this race of life and achievement. Uh, and so through reading uh, about societal issues, I came upon an article that listed all of these flaws that I thought I had as, as an individual. And that's when I realized that I had merely absorbed my environments. Um, growing up in, 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 in the middle of a city, you know, graffiti and, and used books in school and, and just uh, different uh, mixed messages that sometimes were given in our, in our roles as student um, in classrooms for over a decade of growing. Um, and so after I realized that I was a product of my environment, um, no longer was it an, a personal issue. It was a societal issue that I took personal, I had a personal stake in. And so that's when I started feeling um, compelled to interrupt um, this assumption, this false assumption that children like me could have, which is why bother, you know, someone else's starting line is just so far. How am I ever going to achieve something if I don't have a degree or I'm not decorated or, you know, introduced as such? Who will believe me? Who will fund my project? Because, uh, you know, how there are so many people, you know, maybe trying to do what I'm doing and there's only so much money to go around. So um, just as I think any one of us realizes when we put society ahead of our ourself we we accept that being uncomfortable is all right so accepting the, the feeling of discomfort it, i believe is part of change because obviously the institutions that we have um, in place are, are there for a reason and that means the masses there are masses and masses of people um, navigating life through them. So it can feel like almost like you're swimming upstream by yourself, which is not true. We're actually not by ourselves, but that kind of going against the grain of just how things are. It's always been like this, right? Um, it can feel very uncomfortable. Um, so as I decided that, you know, it's all right to feel uncomfortable and actually sometimes you have to get over yourself too, right? Um, <laughs> there's some of that shedding of um, ego, I think, when you, when you take up a cause or you, you're willing to put yourself out there and without knowing what, what the end result will be, which, is, which was my case when I founded City Strings. Um, you know, feeling uncomfortable um, and not feeling like you have all the backing, um, that, that, that became all right. Because I realized that people like me, I, I, I'm, I'm a segment of the population. And if I wish that that segment of the population, people that don't have certain means, if I wished that they had more in, in, to work with, 
then it's up to me since I identify with this background that I'm talking about. It is up to me to operate as if I do have without get giving being given the permission to do something right if I say well so what you don't have you know your family doesn't have any savings, for example. Well, that doesn't mean you're any less of a person than the next person well if I believe that then it is up to me to behave as such and to do what it is that I think that people for whom i'm taking up a cause should be able to do. And so that is kind of how I've um, carried on for the past uh, decade. Um, and, you know, as we've seen in the past uh, two years, um, the national conscience uh, has kind of come to terms in some ways um, with really taking a look at why things are the way they are when it comes to racial equality and inequality and why is it that way and and what are we doing on a daily basis that is either upholding that inequality or what is it we can do to change those things um and so those of us who have been in the trenches and i might dare say uh, those of us who have uh, existed um, unapologetically as people who have been disenfranchised in one or many ways, um, all of a sudden we're being sought out. In the past two years during the pandemic, during the cancellation of concerts, which has <laughs> devastated the performing arts uh, institutions, uh little uh, organizations in the trenches and i'd be really interested ash as to what you've experienced with castle of our skins we've been sought out uh, because you know all of a sudden it's the little guy uh who's been taking up this cause for a number of years that people are interested in in hearing more about it because i don't know it's just it's just it's just really interesting shocking and um yeah, I just really appreciate it, but it's, it's interesting how when everything was going on fine before the disruption of the pandemic and we were stuck in our living rooms to really ponder everything about ourselves, our lives, our country, our world, and, you know, everything, our systems, our, our <laughs> supply chain, everything. Why are we doing this? Um, you know, um, things that were not important when everything was fine. Um, have become more important. Ash, what do you think about that? Yeah, I uh, I definitely uh, understand firsthand um, Kessel of Her Skins. It sounds like two uh, city strings is 10 years. Yes. 10 years, yeah. Yes. Yeah, we're, we're in our ninth season um, and already planning for season 10, but uh, have have been here doing the work and the ideation certainly goes deeper than than 10 years but have certainly been here doing the work and then the uh, it's it's very cyclical so you can look back at at history and see in thinking about in music in, in the 70s where there is a, a large national wave of orchestras american orchestras commissioning black composers and black composer this black composer this great and then that that um, flatlines very quickly and decades go by decades go by something like 2020 happened huge spike let's let's engage with um, black artists black creatives support 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 etc and history you know history doesn't repeat it rhymes I, I remember someone recently was reminding me about this but um, we may not crest as high as we have in the past historically, but the same pattern is inevitable. And it has been for, for centuries. Uh, so I'm, I'm excited, hopeful, I'll, I'll be swept in this moment to, <laughs> to do what I can um, as, as best as anyone can. I've already been swept sometimes against my, my will to your point. I've already been doing this work 10 years and sort of why now? Um, hopeful that we don't dip as far down to that flat line, but recognize that that is the trajectory 
um, and hope that it's not as disruptive, the peaks and the valleys in the future because of the work that, that is going on right now. But to say that this is, uh, this, this, will, this moment will break that historical trend of ebbs and flows is uh, not realistic. But again, that shouldn't be a deterrent for, for putting in as much effort now to at least curb, flatten the curve we heard very much during this pandemic. And if we can at least narrow again, those peaks and those valleys. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, it is definitely exhausting. Uh, and my frustration had come quite quickly in the repetitive nature of uh, what it is that I was was asked and what it is that I was able to offer. Mm -hmm. Repetitive to the point where it's, how did we get here? What do we do? Uh, and there's only, there's only so many answers to that, so many sort of creative ways of saying, how did we get, oh, okay, if you, you need yet another answer, um, to the point where elevations of conversation, actual action, um, uh, more more nuanced. Um, I don't even want to say discussions, but but putting money where where your mouth is and actually taking taking stances and making space, etc. Sort of the, the movement aspect, the active Definitely. verb aspect, um, felt felt like it wasn't happening, <laughs> and it was it was very much talk. Um, and to some extent, I I still feel that way in some circles and uh, in some of the DEI work that I do. Uh, I am, am baffled. It feels as though I've I've been thrust back in time when I when I engage sometimes with conversations and uh, how how rudimentary it seems some of the conversations still are. Mm -hmm. And I recognize again we're we're at different points, but I I, I feel quite advanced, uh, and I think I can speak on behalf of a lot of Black people that we feel quite advanced and it's like, well, we've, we've been telling you for, you know, how many, how many centuries? So it, it's, it's a little bit of a disconnect and it's exhausting. Um, just being very, very honest about that. But I, I, I do recognize, and I do think that in the spirit of, um, in the spirit of Ubuntu, I am because we are, this is a collective effort. I am as much part of this system as a black female violist. Um, as anyone else, and how can I be uh, active and not complacent, not uh, disgruntled, and and not frustrated? I can feel those things; those are human things. But um, and I should say, how how can I leverage them so it's beneficial for the collective? So um, I, I sort of teeter totter, I guess, with with that range of emotions of pouring into advancing for future and making sure that I am as advantageous of this moment as anybody else, because I am a product to your point of, of the system like anyone else. Um, and just the total exhaustion <laughs> um, of, of the work. So I, I recognize that as well too. So I, I have a question that actually um, springboards into something that you both talked about in different ways, which is, you know, um, Bithy, you talked about going against the grain of what you sort of see and, and experience. And Ashley, you had a quotation about breaking through the crust. And in a previous conversation we talked, you both talked about disruption as being an important part of what it means to be an artist. Um, and I wonder if you could talk about what you mean by that and what does that look like? Um, and, and maybe, um, sort of in the few minutes before we're going to take the commercial break, also talk about how in the ways that you disrupt, what does that lead to? What is the world that you're that you're seeking to to co-create through your artistry? Well, I guess I'll take that one and I guess I'll just um, uh, talk about the story that comes to mind. Right. And um, to Ashley's point, this isn't surprising to me, but it was surprising to someone. So this kind of illustrates it. So City Strings was performing um, in a building in Roxbury a few years ago, and someone involved in the school system, um, uh, someone with authority in the school system stopped and was just 
awestruck by city strings. You know, here we had maybe 25 um, children of color playing together, beautiful music, and they could not understand, they just couldn't understand it. They couldn't understand, who are you? What, what is this, you know? And I could talk for an hour as to why I'm disappointed that that is surprising, especially by someone who's in, authority in the school system. But um, nonetheless, it was shocking to them. And it's not a unique response to our group. I, I didn't uh, answer this question earlier, but I identify as a composer. And um, what City Strings does uh, is there is multi layered composition going on so a three year old can play with a, a 30 year old and it all makes sense and it's music. I just can't do twinkle twinkle I just, you know, recitals are just not my thing. Uh, and so beginners even play beautiful music. So disruption of, um, you know, the scene that someone ex uh, expects when they go to a concert hall in this country, I'll just speak from what I know. Um, you're not going to see racial um, representation. You're not, you're not going to see equal representation of all of the uh, communities of color on the stage. It does not mean that there are not many people of color who play instruments, um, high caliber artists, um, very um, able composers in the um, communities of color. It is not a representation of what is really going on in our world. It is a representation of who is chosen to be featured. I mean, I love Bach and I love Beethoven, but really, I mean, honestly, like how many times is the same program going to be <laughs> showcased in the same in the same um, hall year after year? You know what I mean? There are so many composers, just for, and as, as an example. So City Strings, is kind of the um, the vision that I have in my mind is that um, that that youth of color. I am the child who we serve, right? I am that child. I'm just not a child anymore, but I am that person. You can do anything else that anyone else does. You're just not given. You're not. The, nobody's opening the door for you. You're usually not on the red carpet because there's a select and there's a whole you know, world of games that goes on. And that's a whole other story. Some of that makes the news. But anyway, the point is, when you are an impressionable child, and you turn on the television, or you go to a concert, if you're lucky enough to get into the concert hall, there's, you're not going to see yourself up there. For the most part, you're not going to see yourself up there. So from the beginning, you learn that it's not for you. Um, because for whatever reason that you will pick up as you get older, you're not desired, you're not desirable. Why? Well, there's no good reason for that, nor is it acceptable. So what I did was I took zero money and decided that I was going to take my little cello and offer it to uh, 12 or 14 kids at 12th Baptist and you know, people started uh, helping me rent the cellos. And after three months, we put on a concert. We videotaped it because if you don't document, especially with no money, you know, it didn't happen, and no one will ever know that it happened. Uh, that was ten years ago, and we've never stopped. And we've always brought in more money. Um, and we just now cleared over a hundred thousand dollars, which for us is huge, this year. Um, so, so our group is a representation of what I believe every child should know. And the fact that people are shocked to see somebody with 10 fingers, two eyes and two ears play an instrument because they their skin color is different than what is showcased on the, the stage of Symphony Hall, um, you know, that is what we're disrupting. And so that the children that get to experience performing in very well respected venues like uh, Museum of Fine Arts, the Boston Symphony Orchestra um, uh, Education Department is inviting us. Uh, we were supposed to go to Jordan Hall. 
in a collaborative concert that got shut down in 2020. We've collaborated with with professionals such as Castle of Our Skins, Ash Gordon, and and, her, and composers through her um, organization. When children are esteemed a certain way and welcomed into these spaces, they learn that they are to be respected. They will expect that. They shouldn't expect anything less. And so that is in, in, in that is the way that in my small amount of space and ability and time, mm -hmm. that's what I'm disrupting that for maybe 40 or 50 children, they have somehow gotten a glimpse of a high level of respect. And, you know, shame on our, um, you know, education system, educational system, there's a teacher and there's a student and maybe if you if you practice enough and you get enough A's, maybe one day you can you can be a leader. Well, no, that's not how it, that's that that's not reality. If you can if you can do something or support your peers, you are already a leader. And that's how we also flip the um, you know this kind of hierarchy that is 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 very much instilled in our um, systems. So that's that's one example of the disruption and what I see in my mind as a more just society. Um, you know, it's not about a certain race, but where there is pain and where there is disenfranchisement, then that is what I'm um, particularly interested in, especially when it's the community I come from. So, thank, thank you, you. Bethia. Yeah. Thank you. Ash, did you have anything that you wanted to add before we go to our commercial coming up? Sure. Yeah, I, I think um, head, heart, and hand comes comes to my mind. So to Bithia's point, disrupting perspective. Um, Castle of Our Skins is a Black arts institution, and we, we center Black people, Black programming, Black histories um, through, through the work that we do, through the collaborations that we foster through the spaces where we engage. And for, for Boston, as rich of an arts city as it is, and certainly rich historically as it is, doesn't, um, doesn't credit the Black excellence that has helped found this, this city. Um, academic institutions that were founded in 1863 and admitted Black students here in Boston and Boston publishing companies and um, uh, alumni of those institutions, organizations that were started, uh, conversations nationally and conferences that happened here aren't aren't known. Uh, and disrupting the perspective to Bithia's point, if you don't see that, if it's not reflective, if that history in, in, in my case isn't uh, paralleled with the, the sort of, or juxtaposed with the oddities of, of the world around it, <laughs> um, then then it becomes an impossibility right and so just dis disrupting perception that no actually this castle of our skins is not an anomaly we are one of the many organizations that have historically done this and i'm literally just carrying on this work and if you don't know well here here's this organization that can help um change that perspective perspective for you through through knowledge just plain and simple through knowledge um so so that is very much part of the work that we do. And then the, the heart aspect is the em emotional attachment to it. So if it seems an impossibility, if it if it doesn't seem, um, or, or if it seems othered. So a whole concert in February by black composers, it, it, it relegates it to a particular um, time and a place and association. With Castle of Our Skins, I like to say we flood the collective consciousness. So if you don't see something or if you see it rarely, then it has this sort of vague attachment to you. But when we think of fondness, Bach and Beethoven, you referenced, um, Bithia, when we think of fondness, when we think of the actual action of creating something to be beloved, beloved classics, what are the masterpieces, et cetera, the canon, airtime, popularity, repetition, repetition is also hugely part of that so our disruptive effort is to flood collective consciousness everything that we do we just finished a four-month virtual uh, miniature challenge of little tiny haikus and tankas tiny tiny poems and um, 19 30 second pieces for flute and harp also with with students engaged for viola and um, piano over 70 videos daily for four months to flood collective consciousness that 
we we are here this this is a, a normality not right. an abnormality it's not some some uh oddity that that we're experiencing to again change that perspective and then also change one's uh empathy understanding connectivity its resonance so it can become beloved and and favored and normalized in that way and then the hand aspect is the action aspect so the the sort of um in inspiring other organizations, inspiring other uh, people, right, to be those leaders, to take a step forward on the curiosity that they have just fostered for themselves, the understanding and learning and awareness that they have just garnered, to do something about it. So to take this information, which is, as far as I'm concerned, open source, uh, and I'm just here to help share, or Castle of Skins, I should say, is, is here to help, um, showcase and, and highlight and share, take that information and actually do something. Bring it to your students, bring it to your community, share on the histories. Uh, music is definitely central to the work that we do largely, uh, classical music, but also arts. We have a program coming up, knock on all sorts of wood that the program still goes on, uh, given all that's going on in the world, inspired by African-American quilting traditions, which literally making beautiful things out of scraps is what, for me, that, that uh, embodies as well too. But um, learning about African American quilting traditions and Guise Bend quilters and modern quilters and historical quilters and um, the communal aspect behind that and how that speaks larger to, to community learning um, uh, and, and all sorts of cultural things that are wrapped up into a concert experience uh, is, is part of that learning and understanding. The history, the stories, the narrative, etc. Then being able to act on that and uh, use that information in ways that I couldn't have dreamed of, nor, nor really should I, because I need that collective uh, effort to help dream of what possibility could look like. Mm -hmm. um, and for the for the vision for Castle of Our Skins, really centering uh, Black people, our arts, history, cultures, um, universally. And right now, it's very marginalized and. Uh, maybe sort of poking through uh, the margins and coming closer to a center in some places, but still very, very marginalized. So to normalize and to center our our histories, our excellence, the the contributions, uh, and have it be as as common as anything else that we have already experienced would would be what ultimately our vision is. Mm. Thank you both. Thank you. Yeah. This has been a wonderful conversation and I, I hate to pause, but I also want to give an opportunity for a final touch to be showcased again. Um, and then we will move into our Q&A session. So at this time, we encourage our audience participants to put their questions in the chat and we will go through those and perhaps continue this conversation um, that is so important to have. So thank you. Um, and we will show our commercial for Final Touch again. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, I'm Katherine Hardaway here at Final Touch Boutique in Dudley Square. Uh, this is a family owned business. I am one of the owners. Uh, the other owners are Dan Abu Bashir, my, my husband, and Harris Hardaway, our son. We also have store manager, Merlene Burrows, and we make up the team of Final Touch with class. Hi. Usually you come in, you'll see my husband, Abu Bashir. Back in uh, 2005, my wife just said, I got an idea. Hey, what about a boutique accessory store? And I said, hey, why not? You'll see Harris, our son, who is really the one who does all of the very fashionable windows that people come by and admire. I'm Harris, and uh, this is what happens when you shop in Nubian Square. You get beautiful clothes. Um, we have our wonderful customer. Her name is Jackie and she's also a model for our store. Our customers are our models. You have an entire ensemble from Final Touch Boutique. She's wearing a beautiful off-white shawl uh, with the faux fur that's lined around and trimmed, the gloves. And as she opens up her shawl, you'll see this beautiful sequined cheetah print, and it comes with the vegan leather pants. 
It's a beautiful, beautiful dress. Now, if you'll follow me this way, I can show you more. I love this. This color is called Fawn. This is a, another vegan leather off the shoulder. We do all styles, Western, American styles as well. We have an entire section dedicated to our uh, African print. Yeah. A beautiful pattern in the print. And so what you can do is match this with this. It's a very casual piece. If you throw a necklace or some earrings with this, you could wear this to work. We're located at 17 Warren Street in Nubian Square, Boston. Our hours of operation are Monday to Wednesday, 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. and Thursday to Saturday, 10 a.m. to 7 p.m. www.finaltouchwithclass.com and also Final Touch Boutique. It's all here in Nubian Square, so please come join us. Yeah. All right, welcome back. Um, and I hope folks will take a visit to uh, the boutique when they're visiting Nubian Square and, and look at all the beautiful fashions there in this new year. So we have a few minutes. We have about uh, uh, 10, 15 minutes for questions and answers um, from our audience. So the audience is welcome to um, send us and send uh, Ashley and Bithia questions through the chat function or through, through Q&A. Um, so you can think about what kinds of comments were made that you'd love to kind of plumb a little further and ask a little bit more about. Um, and then I, as we're uh, waiting for folks to percolate a, bit, a little bit, I wondered if you could talk a bit about um, one of the things that you mentioned during our, our sort of rehearsal discussion for the, in preparation for tonight about, um, you mentioned a few times, Bithia and Ash, about the importance of understanding history or, or considering history in activism. And history is an important part of the work of the urban ministry. So I'm really interested for you to reflect on why does it matter for us to, to learn history in, in doing and in trying to make change for the future. Well, I, I guess I'll start. I, I feel like Ash, I feel like you're really a history buff. So I was gonna let you start, but. Uh... <laughs> um, well, I, I don't, I can, I can say something really quick uh, and then, sure. and then if you want to take it. Um, yeah, I, I think there's, there's, uh, it's history is very instructive, uh, and to to understand and to know the potential uh, of possibility in in all sorts of gradients from horrific to uh, honorable, right? Um, so so it's instructive in that kind of way, and I think it's also hugely inspiring. So for me, I'm a, I'm an alum of New England Conservatory, as is my co-founder, Anthony R. Green, uh, composer pianist from New England Conservatory. And between the two of us, multiple degrees we couldn't name or had been exposed to black composers, both of us black musicians. Uh, and so doing not an archaeological dig of, of in terms of research, but but a simple search percolating on a, on a curiosity uh, revealed so much including fellow alma mater, uh, NEC alma mater, um, musicians, composers, uh, educators, who we were connected to through this institution that we had no idea. And that for us was very, very powerful uh, to be able to find examples, representation, and affirm the possibility of what, what it is that we can do. So it, it's, it's so ingrained in, into the work uh, of Castle of Our Skins, and, and as I shared earlier, I'm I'm a nerd, and I really enjoy that aspect, and, and do find it really engaging. Um, and I I find with history, it is instructive, yes, and it also is is so uh, it it helps with creativity. I guess I'll say that um, thinking about uh, enslaved 
Africans who envisioned freedom, where did they get the sense of what that looked like, especially if they were several generations from the continent? Uh, and the possi possibility of dreaming something that uh, you haven't had a connection to is definitely real. And I think that is is hugely part of, of the work that we do as well. Um, but there there's also this affirming sense that I, I understand I have something in my blood that is attached to something else, uh, to some other awareness, perspective, understanding of the world. Um, I, yeah. And, and I, I think that, again, that's, that's powering and you, you can just feed off of that. Well, I almost started clapping. I was like, no, this is not that kind of venue. <laughs> I was like, I, I felt compelled to clap the, the part about something in my blood that, you know, um, you know, compels me to do what I'm doing without even realizing it. So um, I think, or at least for myself, I gravitate towards certain stories to prove that it's possible or what can I, what I can do. Uh, so hearing the stories of people who perhaps didn't know how to read, um, acquiring that skill and then um, <laughs> providing housing for a multiple people or someone um, who was previously enslaved, um, you know, becoming this powerhouse speaker and a change agent. Or what really fascinates me um, is the whole host of stories of the everyday person, the everyday person during the civil rights movement that gave people rides or um, women who organized and met uh, in, in basements of churches and baked cakes and, and sold them to raise the money to, to found an organization, the everyday person. I feel like, I, I believe that more of us would do more activism if we really felt, if we really understood the answer to, well, what can I do? What can I do? Little me, there's this big problem. I feel like that is, part of the paralyzing um, question that a lot of people have. And to hear the, 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 the host of stories of the everyday people who took everyday things like flour, milk, and sugar, and made it possible for people to, to be free, uh, for people to gain access to, um, you know, what they needed to then create generational wealth. Uh, I just I just think it's so fascinating. Um, the common, I don't even like the word common person, but the phrase common person, but people like us that had what we have at our fingertips, we have more than that um, available to us in many in many ways in, in, in modern day. Uh, but I think it helps us look around us in our homes um, to see, well, wait a minute, I have those exact same capabilities. Uh, I just think uh, history, like Ash, like you said, um, illustrates for us what is possible. Great. Thank you. Thank you. So we do have some questions coming in and I hope that we have time to get to most of them. Um, and I apologize if we don't get to all of them, but one question is now where, and this is coming from Grace, where can we hear City Lights string perform live or virtually? Well, thank you. Um, City Strings is at citystrings.org. There is a video on our homepage now where we, uh, you'll see a performance that we recorded at uh, GBH Fraser Performance Studio. Mm -hmm. And yeah, there's also a contact page you can write to us so that we can update you when hopefully live performances return. Awesome, thank you, Vithya. We have another question from Dave Harrington. Uh, Ashley and Bithia, it's great to see you again. Um, wonderful to meet you, Ashley. Thanks so much for sharing your experiences and your background that led you to these programs. What are the barriers you face to making the programs even larger, reaching more children and adults, helping them expand their sense of what is possible? Yeah, I can start with that one. And we're we're active right now in uh, addressing, I guess, this this barrier that that you're you're naming. 
Um, and that that's capacity. So Castle of Our Skins was co-founded by myself and again, a colleague Anthony R. Green 10 years ago. Uh, and it has grown to include three part-time staff. I'm the only full-time uh, staff member. We do have a board, but uh, you know, to change the world takes, I, I don't wanna say an army, but it takes, it takes a, a collective, it takes a group. Um, and we are not as small as we started, but we're still small. <laughs> so, so the human resources uh, definitely is, is needed, an executive director, a development um, director, development coordinator for fundraising, a marketing director for publicity, um, all, all would be hugely helpful. And then obviously amassing the human resources talks very much hand in hand with needing a physical space um, to be able to uh, have a cooperative kind of uh, understanding and working together to be able to build, to be able to do program and that kind of thing. Ownership is huge in terms of generational wealth, as you had referenced, uh, Bithia, ownership of land is huge uh, and not being renters and having the, the fiscal capability to be able to own and operate uh, when we are not there yet. So. Um, as, as much as I would love to pour, pour and give, it's exhausting to continue to do that if, if this structure isn't replenished. Uh, and the structure for us to replenish really has to do with the organizational capacity, the humans and the physical space. Oh my goodness, Ashley, I'm telling you. We also, City Strings also has three part-time staff. Yes, <laughs> no development person and a growing number of students. Uh, we've expanded by over 50% in the last six months. Um, the excitement is there, um, but like Ash said, uh, without, you know, without the ability to have uh, more staff, the, the, the barrier is that you usually do not acquire more funding unless you prove need. And that is usually illustrated by your taking on more that would demand more capacity. So it's like cart before the horse, not to mention there are only a few major sources of funding in Boston and a whole host of organizations that go after these same funds every single year. So, you know, these um, service organizations who are all, you know, we're all serving community uh, and trying to make uh, this this city, this world a better place, we are put in a competitive uh, situation with one another in order to um, to to obtain funding. Also, another uh, barrier is the institution of philanthropy. It is starting to change, but the uh, institution of um, you know that that thrives on 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 sad stories, you know, and need, and this kind of identity of well, where you know, hurt, who's hurting the most, you know, um, you have to be successful enough, but also, you know, um, what I'm trying to say, if I if I stop speaking in code, for example, you know, if you if you are if you are a child of color who lives in in an economically distressed zip code, that does not mean that you are at risk. The old institution of philanthropy thrives on those that type of label, you know, at risk youth, you know, um, crime intervention. These children are normal children that were born in Roxbury or near or live in Roxbury. So um, the labels that that the institution of philanthropy uh, has been compelled to support, those same labels are detrimental to the communities that we serve. Mm -hmm. um, and so there is this um, struggle that I, I hope will um, improve, but um, I feel, I hope I'm, I hope I'm uh, explaining this well enough, but there are, you know, while you're trying to do the work, you're also trying to obtain funds um, and yet stay true to your goals and, and, and best serve the community. Um, it's just very difficult without capacity. Like Ash said, capacity and space are are pivotal. Thank you. There's um there's a comment uh, from Mary uh, that says thank you both so much. 
I really appreciate your emphasis on artists' role to move people to open their eyes, also reference to moving through discomfort. I've been doing work around civilian casualties from the US drone war and get quite uncomfortable with myself as I show them to friends, but feel compelled to work to lift up our complicity. But your call to be disruptors is giving me some peace and is an entry to not just worrying so much. I just love hearing both of your takes on your journeys. So it's just a comment of gratitude. Thank you, thank you. And likewise, hearing your story also is, uh, is strengthening because we're not alone. We might be working in silos, but we're not alone. Thank you. Monique, would you like to take the next one? I actually lost okay. the questions, yes. Okay, I'll take the next one and then you can pop in. Thank you. I actually think um, what you were most recently saying, Bithya jumps to um, a question from Samaya, um, which it may be the last question we can ask. And we do apologize, we can't get mm -hmm. to them all. And I know people are starting to like fire now and think about it, um, but I did, I think this is a really good one to, to close on um, from Samaya. Thanks so much for tonight's conversation. Question, what situations, interactions, settings, et cetera, replenish your morale and energy for the work that you do? Yeah, I, I can share, um, I think quickly for me, um, I very much enjoy celebrating Kwanzaa and having seven days of reflection of a deep conversation with loved ones, uh, being in safe space, uh, eating is also nice <laughs> as part of that. But um, having dedicated time for community building is, is such a reminder of why humans are social creatures and how much I can uh, how much I can offer just with my presence. I don't need to bring a, a fresh break sourdough bread. <laughs> I can bring myself, that's enough. Um, and likewise, that your your story, your, your history, your, your lived experience, you, the aura that you carry with you all the time is, is enough to um, be a, a catalyst for something, for, for someone else as a recipient to feel something. Uh, so, being in fellowship with others, which I know is extremely difficult, obviously, for, for where we are right now. Um, but it doesn't have to be with uh, crowds and masses, uh, literally with just someone or, or a small group of people that hold you as a cherished being and vice versa. Um, if, that, if that makes any sense, I find that very, very uh, replenishing having just gone through that experience. Thank you. I would have to say being with family and also um, hearing what I was hoping to accomplish come out of the mouths of my students at City Strings. Uh, when we say, well, what have you learned this year? You know, and they say, well, communication is respectful here and it feels like a family. And, you know, we don't teach them a creed or a saying or, you know, we don't teach them these kind of branding messages, but to hear that it's happening is very uh, replenishing for me. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. So I think we are wrapping up. We are coming to a close and I'm grateful for all that has been shared, the wonderful work that you are doing as women, as artists, as activists. And one final thought is from the audience, you know, people want to help. They want to join in and do some of the, to support the work that you're doing. How can folks do that? You can go ahead, Vithya. Oh, okay. Well, for City Strings, if, if you um, go to citystrings.org and send us a message, I will say that, and Ash, you, I'd love to hear uh, your answer to this. But one of the difficult things while you're running an organization is organizing people. If you have friends that all want to uh, support and get together and do something fun and interactive and support a cause, that, that's huge. 
individuals, we love individuals, but um, working as groups, if you could organize your friends and yourselves, that would help us tremendously. Thank you. Yeah, I, I'll I'll totally understand and, and echo that as well too. Um, I sometimes it gives me anxiety when people ask how they how can I help? How can I get involved? I want to volunteer, mm -hmm. and for for me, um, I recognize that as as and I, I receive that as appreciation, and it also means work for me, more work for me. Um, and I have myself, I have my staff, I have my board, concert seasons, etc. There's there's a lot for me to have to, to specifically manage. So the sort of self-managed groups, this is what we like to do during the pandemic. People sold banana bread, people created t-shirts, then sales went to Castle of Our Skins. People had a CD and portions would go. People had artwork, they had um, a live stream and proceeds, with, all just saying, hey, I've organized, I've done this, I, I, this is what we're offering. Uh, I have airtime uh, and I'm going to make a reference, a shout out to Castle Lover Skins. I'm going to like, tweet, follow, share out your work. Great. Thank you. It, it means it means the world to me um, to take the sort of head heart hand approach and think about what actively can I do um, in, in communion to, to Bithia's point. Um, that said, I, I think it's always great. I, I love connecting with people. And as I shared before, one one on one interactions for me are are really great. I, I appreciate those and um, enjoy them. So you can reach out. Um, Castleskins.org is our website. You can reach out on the contact form there. You can find my email. It's my name, Ashley at Castleskins.org. I spell my name, not uh, how you may think. So just uh, head to the website for the email address. Um, join our, our newsletter. We're pretty active on social media. I referenced our four month miniature challenge. Uh, so you can find that on our YouTube um, page as a, as a playlist. You can certainly find it on Instagram and Facebook where we had it, uh, as well as Twitter, um, and be able to engage with us that way. And I, uh, as, as much as Zoom is becoming um, less appealing. I'm, I'm open for Zoom calls and uh, phone calls um, type of a deal to, to connect and just share as uh, I, I recognize the success that we have is because of people before me, organizations before, and we are living that history now. This, this will be part of the history that people reflect back on. So um, thinking very, very communal in, in how we can work together. So happy to work together and feel free to reach out. Great. Thank you, Ashley. Thank, Thank you, you. Bidia. Thank you both. Thank you. Thank you. And Thanks. we, um, so we wish you both uh, fruitful and wonderful and peace filled and disruptive at the same time, 2022.